Mistakes. Look, I've made my fair share of them. Mistakes are the most expensive tuition around, but often it's the most profound and lasting education at the same time. See, some of the most instrumental lessons come from the harshest teacher experience. It's required for the hard headed and the learned. Mistakes are indifferent. They're unbiased, plaguing those with the best intentions and the hardest working alike. Hard work can't and won't save you from making mistakes. Hell, hard work may increase your susceptibility to mistakes as it can create busyness or where we act before knowing. Working too hard can even come at the expense of other important aspects of our lives. But let's face it, making mistakes is almost like a rite of passage to anyone with any vision of consequence. But maybe one of the greatest mistakes of all is trying to avoid them at all costs, therefore limiting our life and our vision. Lack of vision might be one of the greatest mistakes with the most severe consequence too. Living unfulfilled and without a feeling of adventure or purpose in order to avoid making a mistake. My most substantial mistakes were accompanied by harsh judgment, self-judgment. This judgment made me feel unworthy and it really chipped away at my confidence. It also led me down a road of work over family, hell, work over health, and well, work over almost everything. So I'm gonna share those mistakes. The ones I least want to talk about because that's where the real and maybe the best lessons are and also where the most forgiveness and healing are really required. So here's the question. Where would I want to hide or not admit something because I don't know, I, I care about or I'm protecting my reputation or where do I feel embarrassed or that I should have known better? Hell, I've written books, right? especially considering the books that I did write or the speeches that I've given over time. Well, many of the ingredients that led to those books came from my worst moments and those mistakes. People used to ask, how the hell do you know all this that you write about? Especially when I was in my 20s. Experience. Simply put, it was experience. Most people in the financial and money game, they rarely learn. Instead, they defend. They hide behind cliches like you're in it for the long haul or the market goes up, the market goes down, but it always goes back up. I'm sure you've heard those, right? For those people, they don't have 20 or 30 years of experience. They have sales training with one year of indoctrination that they keep defending the markets on sale. Really? That's what they say. You've heard it all before. It requires intellectual honesty and a willingness to admit you might not know it all or that you've made a mistake to actually learn, to actually progress. But without that willingness, we often hide from our mistakes. We remove ourselves from reality. That's a really dangerous place. We stifle our self-worth. We suppress pain and judgment and we remain numb and removed from the truth. Look, I get it. It's hard work for me to admit when I'm wrong. I like being right. It's uncomfortable to acknowledge that things may be different than I thought or first viewed them initially, right? Recently, someone posted on my YouTube channel a reminder of a past mistake. This mistake led me to a, a courtroom, it led me to sleepless nights. The silver lining was the lessons, well, and all this silver hair on my head, that's a bad but true joke. They posted this endorsement I gave of someone who is now in jail. Look, I'll put that link down here in the comments. I consider this person to be a mentor and of the highest integrity. Back in the days when I sold insurance, he was a general agent. He would have me speak at his insurance agency and I ended up doing joint work and splitting commissions with his agents. This was really an early lift to my business. This general agent would meet with me each month, give me a generous payout with percentages and even marketed dinners where we'd both speak and generate business together and it kind of helped launch my speaking career. Plus look, he paid me what he said he would when he said he would. My experience before him was not that way. So I got to know his wonderful wife and his kids, became really good friends with his son. We did annual trips together and this was for years. So look, I felt very confident referring other people in business to become life insurance agents with his agency. Now it's interesting, even now when I say this, I wanna justify away and excuse everything to deflect any of my responsibility. I wanna point out there was an endorsement of him as an insurance agent, not a fund manager, but the reality is, I'd refer a dozen people to him who lost money investing in his real estate. I was one of them. I invested money with him. And so did some of my family. 
I was even supposed to be a 50% owner in a 45,000 square foot, three story building with him. That's where I officed for years. I mean, supposed to, that should have been a huge red flag. I didn't see it. I was so caught up in the design of the building and what it could mean to my business and my ego. There was an amphitheater for events. I had arcade games in our break room and bamboo floors and glass walls. It was a thing of beauty. I'd sound like a tech douche, right? And my ego loved telling people this was my office. I felt important. It was part of my narrative of success, but that narrative was blinding me from reality. This person I was going to partner with told me that he would use his credit for the construction loan, and then once long-term financing was secured, he would set up an LLC where I would then own 45%. This building, look, I'm telling you, it was impressive. It won architectural awards locally and even nationally. People that met me in this building were often impressed. One individual, after meeting, asked me to speak at his event. He's like, this is amazing. I should have you speak at my event. Not because he really heard me speak. He just saw the building. Now, some people might call this man that saw the building an exaggerated. I think liar might be much more appropriate. He introduced me at one of his events as owning all the skyscrapers in Utah. Like, what the fuck? I... I don't think three stories counts as a skyscraper. And again, I never even had ownership on paper. And this was the only building that I was actually involved with. So after this guy introduced me at his event, I walked on stage and said, I'm not sure who the hell he's talking about, but I hope to meet them or become that person someday. This building created folklore or an exaggerated reputation for me at a young age. I was officing there from 2006 to 2009. When hosting events or having clients visit the office, people ask about the building. When hosting events or having clients visit the office, people ask about the building. Sometimes I would introduce them to the owner. He was taking investment money in the building. He told me it was for improvements of the second floors. It wasn't finished like floors one and three. But he took more money than was required to start the two other commercial building projects he had in other cities, but he wasn't disclosing it. And look, as the economy you know, just turned and there was so much turmoil in 2008, things got worse with his fund. People started requesting redemptions because of their struggles, and his real estate was losing value simultaneously. So instead of telling them the truth, he kept taking on new investors' money to pay the interest in the real estate fund. That makes it a Ponzi scheme. New investor money paying old investor interest. So that's illegal, obviously. But see, his identity came from this fund he started and the interest he paid to people. So people thanked him. They even adored him. And for the difference this interest provided in, in their lives made him feel significant. What started as what he thought was a small lie, hey, everything's business as usual. That would buy him time. That eventually got him serving time. So 2008 was a tough, brutal economy, especially for real estate. So for him to face his investors and tell the truth would have been hard for sure. But I don't think it's as hard as going to jail. Not as hard as losing all those relationships and losing even more money in the process. It's kind of a combination of ignorance and arrogance that would lead to someone taking investors' money when things are imploding. This ignorance comes from not assessing reality, and the arrogance comes from thinking somehow they could outsmart everyone else, and with enough time, they could get to the other side and be fine. That's the ends justify the means type of thinking. I'm going to tell you they don't. Look, in 2008, I found myself in a similar cash flow predicament. I made the mistake of being over leveraged in real estate as well, but I handled it very differently. It was painful. I didn't, it wasn't fun. I had a lot of real estate, residential real estate at one time, single family, duplex, fourplexes. I'd borrowed money from people for some of the down payments. And when the market turned, I did one of the hardest things I ever did in my career. Let them know that the changing economy was having a major impact on me. First, my real estate was losing value. These losses put some of my partners in bankruptcy, leaving me with a portfolio that was struggling and creating negative cash flow. So losing partners and hemorrhaging cash required more of my time. I had to hire to help with this. So I was the money in these deals. The partners were really more the management. Now I was both. So it required time and a whole lot of it. And with this additional responsibility, my business started to suffer. 2008 was the first year after 10 straight years of complete of growth and Inc. 500. I had my first down year. Down year with higher expenses. The rent for this new building I was in. The mortgages and personal loans on over 100 investment properties. Ouch. So I started making calls. I let those that I had lent money to know that I might be late. I was likely to be late. I know I was going to put my head down and work and that I wasn't going to be able to proactively reach out to let them know everything that's going on, but they could call any time. 
I knew that every moment would count and that I had to, to focus to really stay afloat. Almost all these people I'd called understood and they were very supportive. Almost. I let them know that if they wanted money today, they could have a deep discounted amount, but they'd have to give me time if they wanted to have the full amount paid back as I turned things around. I had people in my corner. Instead of lingering worries of not being in communication, they, they knew why I wasn't in communication. As the economy got worse and the person who owned the 45,000 square foot building, they ended up declaring bankruptcy and I ended up getting sued. They didn't tell me they were declaring bankruptcy. They had already claimed it and they're still trying to raise funds for the building. It was kind of a mess. The person suing me had invested $350,000 in that 45,000 square foot building in exchange for a monthly return, but his interest payment stopped. Initially, the investor went after the person who he invested with, the owner of the building. I wasn't in the meetings and I didn't get paid, but I did make the connection. See, but the person taking the money went bankrupt. So the attention turned to me when the attorney advised the client to sue me. This attorney tried to get others that invested through my introduction to sue as well, but he couldn't convince them to do so. So he had one person, but this attorney had hoped that a win with this first client, they could go back to the others and have a class action lawsuit. When I was served papers, I immediately called my attorney to let him know I wanted to call the plaintiff directly. Most people are afraid to be in direct communication, but I thought, well, that'd be another mistake. So I called. The plaintiff was surprised to hear from me and quickly deferred to his attorney. The call was just long enough that I got the feeling that the suit was more of the attorney's idea than his. I also became suspicious his attorney was working on contingency and only going to be paid if he won the case. So the crazy thing is this $350,000 investment for not a very long time, it was only like a year or two, the lawsuit was asking for $650,000 in damages, even though, again, it was only $350,000. And I tried to offer like a settlement of what the legal fees would be, but they weren't interested in that. So we ended up going to the courtroom with judge and jury. My attorney and I had history together. Unfortunately, this wasn't the first time I was sued. I've actually been sued three times. It sounds terrible to admit, but when you do things of consequence. The first lawsuit was from someone I only met briefly. They were a client of one of my partners who had died in a plane crash. I met with most of my partner's clients over a four month span after their death and hosted an event for them as well. And this particular person met someone at the event and they invested with them. They lost money with them. And then they sued lots of people, including me. It was actually dismissed in summary judgment. I didn't take their money. I didn't give them advice of doing any of this, but they were in a bad spot. And again, I New York times bestseller at the time. And the guy was an editor, saw that. So he came after me the second time I was sued. It was actually my fault. Yeah. I, I hate to admit it, but I wanted to sell a ton of my first book, killing sacred cows before it was even released in the process of pre-selling. I had someone offer to buy a huge bulk of books. I now felt indebted to them. So when they asked for some introductions for a real estate deal, I gave them one, but I hadn't really vetted the deal. This client that invested lost money when he did, I let him know that the person he lost money with bought a bunch of books from me. And even though it wasn't a direct form of compensation, there's no way I would have made the introduction. Otherwise later that week I got served. I immediately called my attorney and conceded to most of the things in the letter which really surprised him. Most of the time they just deny that's kind of a strange part of the legal process. People deny everything rather than take responsibility because with responsibility, they feel like they have liability, but I actually had done something wrong here. So quickly we got on a call with my client's attorneys and reached an agreement and a payback plan with one call. I only got something worth thousands of dollars in return it ended up costing me a quarter of a million dollars. So, we both paid the price. Once I paid this person back, I actually did get to have dinner with them and we went over the whole lessons and the entire story. So that was, that was healing and it was helpful. I asked for forgiveness and I learned a lasting lesson. This guy was a friend, an expensive and very painful lesson for sure. But one I'll never forget. And in that tough moment, my attorney could see I'm imperfect, no doubt, but willing to learn and restore integrity to the best of my ability putting my money where my actions and mouth were. When this lawsuit for the building came in, it was filled with misinformation, assumptions, and plenty to deny. My attorney knew I wasn't compensated. He had experienced my referring nature firsthand, and he didn't take any compensation. He didn't pay me anything when I sent referrals. He also seen me take responsibility for this book deal that I just told you about. So regardless 
this is going to be an expensive lesson. $50,000 just for the three days in court, and that didn't count preparation before and any of the post work after. Most people don't do things unless there's money exchange, but my attorney had more referrals from me than any other client and never paid me a dime because it was just a good person to refer to. I like connecting people. I've always felt that it wasn't about tracking each transaction, but showing up as a value creator so I could live a more prosperous life. Even if there wasn't financial capital built, there was relationship capital. And to me, that's the most valuable capital in the world, even though I kind of had, had ruined it in the one lawsuit, right? So going to court really did change my life. I'd never been to a court or inside of a courthouse, and I, I was nervous as hell. It seemed really intimidating. It was unknown. It was, it was pretty scary. But thankfully, my CEO and business partner was there by my side. As I started to stress and worry, he put everything in perspective. He reminded me what my value and vision were, the impact I would still make. And this was be a footnote at most in my story, not my story. My wife had my back and well, she showed up for the trial as well. And she was instrumental in the jury selection process. Her intuition is a, it's a gift and it was so spot on. She pointed out to my attorney that something seemed off with one of the potential jurors and we're still in the selection process. We had used two of our three strikes. And that particular juror, when my attorney questioned him, said that all defendants are guilty and he'd been a plaintiff in over a dozen lawsuits with his business. We had already used the two, so we had to use a third strike, even though we tried to get the judges to strike it out of bias. So our strategy, interestingly, was to keep the most educated people, like attorneys and that, on the, on the jury. And the other side wanted to strike any people with any level of experience or degrees and keep people that were students or, or as young as possible instead with the least life experience. What a process. The opening arguments for my attorney were spot on and brilliant. He said that the plaintiff's counsel would try to draw lines and conclusions from things that were not connected. He called out their exact strategy. I had to restrain myself from opening my arguments because from the plaintiff's counsel, it was really, uh, they were accusatory and inaccurate, but my attorney had warned me and told me just to remain calm and quiet and patient and we'd get our turn when we went up on the stand. Through these three days, we ended up in the judge's chambers twice due to lack of evidence and him questioning the plaintiff's counsel. The judge was giving a warning and asking for evidence. Their side kept saying it would happen when I came to the stand. All right, so a lot riding on that. So it came down to that time. The first session, it was excruciating. Reading through emails out loud, verifying that I was the one that sent them or responded to them. It was slow. It was tedious. It was frustrating. And by the second session, it went from frustrating to liberating. See, at the first recess, my attorney gave me permission to let it go. He said, speak freely as possible with any open-ended questions. And I did. I could read the body language of the jury. Like, they understood what was going on. They got it. There was an interaction with those jury members that I had felt as a speaker on stage before. They were following me, understanding me. And I really lost a lot of that initial fear. After two and a half days, it was time for the jury to make their decision. I wasn't sure how long it would take, so I went a few blocks up the street to my gym. On my walk there, I saw, I saw this like really disfigured and, and disabled homeless woman. She was missing both of her legs. She smiled at me. It really like reached and impacted me at that moment. So her smile added value and her circumstance added perspective. So I gave her some money and then a flood of gratitude kind of enveloped my whole body. It was a tingling and a warmth on a, on a pretty cold day. Even though this woman had difficult circumstances, her smile was loving. I could choose to be happy no matter what the decision of the jury. That's what I, that's that sense I had. I had a great life. I love my wife and kids. I'm close to my parents, in-laws and siblings. I have great friends. I started to really appreciate all that I have regardless of this trial, regardless of the impact on my net worth. It didn't have to impact my self-worth. It actually brought forth more gratitude and love. Help me see things a lot more clearly. I felt a sense of peace knowing my purpose and knowing no matter what the outcome, I had new insights to share and lessons that could help others in difficult situations. Now, before I even made it to the gym, I got a call from my attorney and he said, it's time. It's like, wow, that was super quick. I, I kind of figured that was good news that it was that quick, but I ran back to the courthouse for the decision and the judge called for the jury and I was sitting, you know, just sitting there, my palms started to sweat. And when the, the main juror stood up to start reading, I started to like shake my legs out of nervousness and 
man, when that judge began to ask him questions, it was the first of six charges. My heart just started pounding so intensely. I've only probably felt that one or two other times in my whole life. Once when I was hunting, I could just hear my heartbeat more than I could even hear the judge. Everything just kind of muted and it sounded like it was underwater. And I heard the head juror say, not guilty. <sighs> just had this huge breath, this release, this sigh. Five more questions and five more times. Not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. It's a rush of adrenaline, excitement, and release each time. I hugged my attorney. But then I thought of the plaintiff and, and his losses. I mean, hell, he lost money. I did too. I could feel for him. It wasn't really a time to celebrate, but a time to walk over and shake his hand. I let him know that I was sorry that he lost money and that I had made the connection. And I gave him a copy of a book that I loved and thought he might enjoy. It was kind of like a peace offering. He thanked me and then said something a little surprising. Well, I had to try. I thought to myself, did you? Really? He's this guy in finance. I looked over to his attorney. His hands like, just his head buried in his hands and like laying on the table. And he lost. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you didn't get paid because this was contingency. I held back from reacting to the I had to try statement. Knowing it was more of his attorney's philosophy than his. Even though I was found not guilty, I made a mistake. One that I won't forget. I realized the building owner operated differently when faced with a different circumstance. I saw firsthand how someone I admired could be susceptible to scarcity. People operate differently when things are difficult or when they're in a preservation mode. What happens when someone's back is against the wall? What are their priorities then? What happens when there's a real consequence to keeping or honoring their word? It's not always easy. We really get to know someone's character and resilience when things aren't going according to plan because the building owner had been trustworthy in the past. I didn't look for the signs during hard times. just ignored it. They were there. I just chose not to see them. Another mistake I made was getting caught up in something that wasn't really aligned with my investor DNA. It wasn't aligned with my purpose. It was letting my ego guide the way, wanting to own and show off this building. Commercial real estate is not my expertise. For me, it was a massive distraction, a costly one. I got distracted because I thought more was the goal. More real estate, more money, more recognition. Again, experience is hard to replace and a very, very effective way to learn. Maybe not efficient, but it's effective. Efficient would have been learning from like a book or course or a YouTube video, right? But sometimes those, those lessons just don't go as deep. They don't scar as much. There's several lessons that the painful teacher of experience has definitely showed me. And this is the lessons. Communicate early and often. Do the hard, easy things versus easy, hard. Do the hard things up front and live an easier life along the way. That's what that means. Delivering bad news isn't easy. Asking for forgiveness isn't easy. Doing something of high impact and value, that's not always easy. But doing the hard things up front creates an easier life long term. Mistakes don't make you less lovable. They make you human. That was a huge lesson. Running or hiding from mistakes allows them power over you and prevents you being able to be present or being fulfilled and robs joy. Any unaddressed mistakes become blinders of value and destroyers of vision. Mistakes that go unaddressed, they're doomed. We're going to make that same mistake again or limit who we are in the name of avoidance. We take on more than we can handle. Mistakes are inevitable. So yes, I've made mistakes. But the biggest mistake, the biggest mistake would be to run or to hide, to limit my vision or value, or allow a mistake to define or derail me. It took me, it took time for me to forgive myself, but I chose to learn rather than run. Live, love, learn, repeat. So remember, you're not your mistakes if you own them and learn from them. What have you been holding on to? What have you been running from? What have you been hiding from? What is it that you've yet to accept or own in who you really are? If we can learn from those mistakes, we can forgive ourselves and have a new level of freedom. Hey, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. And if you're enjoying these videos, well, there's good news. More where that came from. So go ahead and click through and watch the next video now.